Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Um, if you like what you see here, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on the a video or the channel, and it just lets us know that we're doing a good job. Um, if you want to support the channel, uh, let me bring this up. I should have had it in front of me. Let's see. There we go thinking about it there we go if you want to go ahead and support the channel uh go have uh, go over to skywatcher.threadless.com um and you can see all the different cool swag that we've got there all this goes to helping grow the webcast as usual um so we definitely appreciate that and then we also have a podcast version of the webcast which can be found wherever you get your podcasts like apple podcast on android um and a bunch of other places as well um, but wherever you get your podcasts, that is where you can check out the Skywatcher What's Up Webcast podcasts. They are just podcast versions of the episodes that you actually see here. And like I said, if you want to support the channel, go over to skywatcher.threadless.com and pick up some cool swag. So, and then of course, if you like what you see here on the channel, please go ahead and subscribe. If you have an idea for an episode, please email us at info at skywatchusa.com. Title it What's Up and let us know your idea. I will let you know that we've pretty much booked out the rest of 2023, um, so everything has been pretty much scheduled. Um, so if you do have an idea for an episode, it probably will not air until next year at this point, unless there's some changes uh, going on. All right, so today we're going to be talking about aperture and basically understanding aperture, but we're going to approach this both visually and photographically. Um, because the approach is a little bit different um, for each application. So hopefully this episode is helpful for uh, those of you out there. Um, I will let you know that we will be talking a lot about the Skywatcher Scope Wizard app. Uh, Scope Wizard is a calculator app that is on Android and iOS. And uh, you can download that. It's free. And it does all kinds of calculations for you as basically like what we're talking about today like aperture gain and speed uh, for your optics and all kinds of other cool stuff and you can get that wherever you get your apps um, like I said it is free so if you want to go out and look for it just look up scope wizard um, that's what it looks like right there all the little controls um, and uh, yeah so we hope uh, um, you can go out and check all of that out and if you need some help calculating some stuff, jump over to Scope Wizard. It's free. You should just have it on your phone. All right. Aperture. So what is aperture to start with? Because when we're talking about stuff, it can get a little different, especially if we're talking about visual applications versus photographic applications. And when I'm talking about aperture, we're actually talking about the physical size of the telescope. Um, so aperture is basically the diameter of the main optic and that's a lens or a mirror doesn't matter whatever is collecting the light um, is basically the aperture of your optic um, larger aperture lens uh, larger aperture the lens of the mirror the the more aperture you've got um, basically it's coming down to how wide your light collecting area is and we're not just talking about the diameter either we're actually talking about the overall surface area which is something i meant to bring up area of there we go um so that's basically what we're talking about there is it's not just the diameter we do have the diameter of say like this 14 inch telescope right here um but if we actually run that you have 154 inches if we're rounding up in surface area of light gathering power. Um, so that is where this comes into play. But that's basically all aperture is. It's just the diameter of your main optic. And that doesn't matter if it's a camera lens or a telescope lens or a mirror or whatever the case may be. That is your aperture. Um, larger aperture is going to provide you with a couple different things. Uh, number one, you're going to get more light. Um, so objects are going to be brighter and more detailed and finer detail can actually be resolved as well. So if it's a bright object, let's say it's like 
the moon or the planets, larger aperture is going to help resolve that finer detail because you get more angular resolution with a larger aperture instrument. It basically comes down to would you want a cup or a bucket? If you're trying to collect water, like if it's raining outside and you're trying to collect water, do you want a cup or a bucket? What's going to collect more? And that's basically how we approach aperture is how much do we want to be able to collect? Now, obviously, a cup isn't going to collect as much water as, say, a bucket is going to collect. Um, buckets are generally wider. That's why you hear like Dobsonians are generally referred to as light buckets um, because they're there to basically collect more light. Um, where if you have something small like a little refractor, it collects light, does the job, but it doesn't collect nearly as much. Um, so for visual applications, uh, aperture is really what we talk about most. Photographically, the game kind of changes a bit. Um, and that's basically what this episode is going to be about, is understanding um, the different applications and what aperture brings to the table for different applications. So for aperture, the human eye is about 7 millimeters in diameter at best. Um, and with that, um, we're only talking 0 0.05 square inches of surface area for our the aperture of our eye and that's if the human eye is running at its best um, obviously as we age the aperture of our eye diminishes a little bit and we're not able to resolve uh, things our vision starts to go um, but at best um, when our eye is fully dark adapted seven millimeters is about the best the human eye will ever be able to do now, in order to get more detail or brighter images to our eye, we need a larger optical instrument to collect more light and act as a larger pupil uh, to collect that light and bring it to focus into our eye. Thus, what a telescope is for. Uh, so for visual, aperture is basically going to rule all of it. The name of the game for visual work is collect as much light as possible. And that is true. Um, no matter what the application actually is, even in observing the sun, more aperture can tend to be helpful to resolve those finer details. Now, obviously, if we're observing the sun with filters, um, you want to make sure that it's filtered properly, but you also don't need as much light. But aperture still does help even on the sun as long as it's handled correctly. Now, the problem when you talk aperture is you're going to start having a balance between portability and size. And as someone who has owned multiple Dobsonians larger than 12 inch, I've had 16, I've had 20, and now I've got my 28. Um, you have to be able to find what's going to work for you. And the best telescope that you have is the one that you use the most. It doesn't matter what size it is. If a little tiny 80 millimeter refractor works best for you and you're out observing the nighttime sky, then that is the best telescope for you. If it happens to be a 20 inch is what works for you, then more power to you. Um, but the best telescope is the one that's gonna get you outside observing or photographing the nighttime sky, just enjoying the hobby ultimately. Um, that is you're gonna be your best instrument. Um, even if your buddy has a 30 inch telescope, um, it doesn't matter because ultimately you're out there having a good time. Uh, larger telescopes are going to have bigger requirements as well. So that's something that you have to consider when you start talking some serious aperture. Um, and another thing is bigger telescopes are also going to be affected by seeing more. Now, we had an episode about this, which was understanding seeing conditions. So if you want to go back and learn more about seeing conditions, you can do that. But a lot of times people will state that their seeing conditions are Bortal 4 or Bortal 5. Bortal levels are the darkness level of the nighttime sky. They are not the seeing conditions. Seeing conditions uh, refers to the stability or clarity of the nighttime sky or the sky in general. Um, seeing conditions refer to clarity and transparency. Um, 
not the darkness. Uh, so seeing conditions will affect a larger instrument much faster than they will a bigger instrument because, or a smaller instrument, because you're looking through more air. Um, the more the more you have to deal with the atmosphere, uh, the more light can be disturbed um, by the atmosphere before it hits the mirror or the lens or whatever you're doing. And the larger telescopes are going to be much more affected by that than, say, a smaller telescope. But when the seeing is good, there is no argument uh, for aperture because the aperture is going to give you not just more light, but you're also gaining that resolution, being able to resolve finer details. So most of the time when I'm using my 28 inch, the planets look better in, say, my friend's 11 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. They just look better because the seeing conditions don't support the full aperture of a 28 inch on the regular. However, on the nights where seeing is good, there is no substitute for a large aperture instrument. Um, and that's one thing when you start to get into the large Dobsonians for visual work. And by large, I'm going to say 18 and bigger. Um, we'll go with that. Um, you start to understand what kind of conditions best support your instrument at that point, especially if you're a large aperture Dob owner. Um, you're able to figure out uh, if the skies are good enough. Now, I've used a handful of telescopes that are larger than 30 inch. And more often than not, the sight and the seeing conditions that the telescopes are being used at don't support an instrument of that size. Um, the telescope that you see right here, uh, it's a 41 or 42 inch telescope. Uh, that was at Grand Canyon Star Party, I think, in 2019. Very impressive instrument. It's huge. Um, this is me next to the mirror box. Um, and the mirror box, when it's actually at like a 45 degree angle, is almost as tall as I am. And that's just the mirror box. Um, but you're talking about a mirror that's like three and a half feet in diameter. Um, but anyway, uh, it's a very nice telescope. But the conditions of the that night just did not support it. The images were bright, but they are not detailed. That's the difference um, when we're talking about seeing conditions versus darkness, um, is that, yeah, the image is bright because we're using a very big, we we're looking at M41, uh, or 41, M51, the Whirlpool. The image was bright, and we're in a dark sky with a big telescope, but the seeing conditions for that night did not support a telescope of that size well. So while the image is bright, it's just not as detailed as you would expect from an instrument of that size. And that's a big problem when you start to own large aperture telescopes like that is not everything is going to be sharp and crisp because the conditions and the location just cannot produce a stable enough sky to support an instrument of that caliber. That's why a lot of these large aperture telescopes for research are on mountaintops. And there's been a lot of observations done for that particular site to ensure that it will support instruments of the size. So uh, that's something to consider when you're going big. Um, that's why as a large aperture daub owner, I would recommend if you are serious about getting into a big telescope, big meaning 18 or bigger, spend some time going to star parties and getting to know people who have those telescopes and get some experience behind it. F a, figure out which one's going to best fit your lifestyle. Like, are you going to need a trailer? Are you not going to need a trailer? Um, but you're going to want to figure all of that out. But also get the idea and observe through many big telescopes to get an idea of what kind of aperture you want to work with. Uh, because the seeing's not going to support a 30-something inch telescope on most nights. It just doesn't. So you that's why my 28 or a 28 inch to 30 inch telescope is probably the largest aperture telescope I would recommend for an amateur it was just doing visual because most of the time the seeing conditions, at least if it's kept at low power, could probably support a telescope of that size. Much bigger, it goes downhill very quickly. So 
something to think about. Now, when you're considering jumping up an aperture, now this goes for any telescope, I would obviously recommend that you go up by a magnitude. Now, magnitudes are, if you're not familiar with magnitudes, magnitudes are the brightness of objects in the sky. Everything in the sky has a measurable magnitude to it. Uh, the limiting magnitude the human eye can see, the dimmest object the human eye can see is about a seventh magnitude from a dark sky site. Maybe a little fainter if you've got good vision, but ballpark seventh magnitude. Um, I believe most of the Messier objects are about 14th magnitude. Um, let me double check. What is the faintest Messier object? Let's see. The faintest Messier object is Messier 91, which is 10th magnitude. Okay. It was a little... Okay, whatever. Um, so the faintest Messier object of the Messier catalog, if you're familiar with those, which I hope you are, um, is, we'll just round it up, is 10th uh, magnitude. So 10.5 roughly is the faintest Messier target out there. Um, you can get a buy with a basic telescope with that. So let's actually look at that. So if you're interested in making an upgrade in your telescope, regardless of the design, I always recommend that you look at how much of a jump you're getting via magnitude. And you always wanna shoot for at least a one magnitude jump when you're looking at larger aperture. Now this is strictly from a visual perspective. So I'm just gonna map the popular aperture sizes uh, real quick. Um, now, we start from 50 and go up to six inch and then we'll pop into the larger aperture stuff. But what you're seeing is the circles are just a graphic representation of the aperture and the aperture is listed below in inches and millimeters. And then the number below that is the limiting magnitude of the aperture listed. So a 50 millimeter telescope, let's say like our Evo Guide 50 or Stellar View has had their little 50 millimeter ED. There's a lot of really popular little APO refractors on the market right now. That's what this page uh, is. This particular uh, image right here is basically representing is kind of the refractors that are available on the market. And obviously there's a bunch of different sizes, but this is just kind of a rounded out version. Um, so let's say a 60 millimeter refractor. That's about the smallest little APO you can get right now for the most part. And it's a popular size, particularly if you're doing astrophotography. But a 60 millimeter APO, a 60 millimeter refractor, which is a 2.3 inch aperture, is gonna give you a limiting magnitude of 11.37, so 11.4. Uh, so if you want to upgrade from a 60 millimeter, and you wanna make sure that you're getting enough of a jump to where it's gonna be visually noticeable, we want to aim for a magnitude jump. Now doing the math, you can see 70 millimeter, 80 millimeter, 100 millimeter, and 150 millimeter. Logically, and or more mathematically, if you are going to make an investment and you have a 60 millimeter telescope now, the next logical jump would be a hundred millimeter because you can see right here that at 60 millimeter our limiting magnitude is 11.4 we'll just round it up the next jump up would be 100 millimeter or four inch which is 12.48 12.5 that's our magnitude jump we went from 11.4 to 12.5 that's a magnitude jump you're going to be able to notice that difference very quickly um, in your uh, views. The views are going to be brighter. They're going to be more detailed. You're going to be able to handle higher power uh, much more. Um, so let's just for verse. This is where we get our scope calculator um, from. Oh, back on scope wizard. We have what's called a light grasp. Uh, button down here light grass comparison so what we can do is our larger telescope is four inch smaller telescope is 2.3 inch 
So the jump from a 60 millimeter to a hundred millimeter is three times the light gathering power. It's a big jump. So when you're actually looking to invest in a larger telescope, it's important that it's particularly if you're just doing this for a visual standpoint, it's important that you take the time, learn the specifications of what your current telescope can produce, and then try to do the math like with our calculator there and try to aim for that magnitude jump. So if you have a 60, look at a four inch refractor or a four inch telescope. That's what you want to aim for. Um, now, if you have an 80 millimeter, that's magnitude 12, uh, you have to make the jump to probably 130, 150 millimeters, so a five or six inch telescope. So if you have an 80 millimeter or a three inch telescope, I would aim for a 120, a 130, a 150. Right in there is where you're gonna get your magnitude jump. Uh, there now as size goes up you also are gonna have to start considering what's gonna work for you um, a three inch refractor like our Evo star 80 very easy telescope to lug around needs a small little mount not a lot of demand jumping up to a six inch telescope let's say it's a refractor gonna need a lot bigger mount um, so those are some considerations when you also go up an aperture is that the bigger the telescope, the bigger the requirements are going to be. So if you have a telescope that needs a mount, you're going to have to buy a mount. If you have a Dobsonian, the Dobsonians get bigger and they become more difficult to lug around. So that's what I'm talking about, a magnitude jump when you're doing visual work. So if you've got a 60, you want a 100 millimeter next. If you have an 80, you're going to want probably a 120 to 150 millimeter uh, next or bigger just always try to calculate what that magnitude jump is going to be that would be your minimum upgrade um, to where it's probably worth the investment unless there's something very particular about that telescope that matches what you need now if we step up to the larger apertures and i obviously ran out of room but we can calculate anything if you guys have questions um, i popped in some of the popular sizes um, within reason we go to the six inch so that's 13 uh, 13 4 magnitude so if you have a six inch let's say you have a six inch Dobsonian because that's very these are now basically Dobsonians that we're talking about here because um, once you pass six inch refractors basically fall out of the the collection um, at this point, we're basically talking Schmidt Casa grains at least up to about 16 inch and then anything larger than 16. Now we're talking about Dobbs, um, but this falls true for any design. So let's say you have a six inch telescope like like a Nexstar 6 SE or one of our uh, six inch Dobbs, like a classic 150. You've got your first telescope. Now I'm ready to make an upgrade. What is my next upgrade going to be? Well, if you have a six inch, the next logical jump, at least looking at the math, would be a 10 inch at minimum. The 10 inch is gonna give you that magnitude jump because you're going from 13.4 to 14.5. So if you have a six, the next telescope you should consider at the very least is a 10 inch. Um, now, if you have a 10 inch, the next logical jump would probably bring you up to 16 inch. Now, the problem here is as the apertures get bigger, that curve starts to plateau a bit. You need to make much larger jumps in order to see an improvement. So, and the improvement becomes exponentially bigger and more expensive um, as you go up. So once you've passed around 14 inch that's where things are going to start to that plateau begins because you can see from a 14 inch the next step up from a 14 is going to be probably like a 22 or 24 inch telescope at that point that's a big difference 14s you know if it's a daub it's usually one person can set something up like that if it's a like a schmidt cassegrain one person can do that too, but you got a lot more work. Let's say you have a C14 and you want to upgrade and do some more deep sky visual work. Well, if you want to notice a difference, uh, you'd probably be looking at minimum, like I said, 20 inch 
at minimum. 20 is not going to give you that full magnitude jump, but you're basically three quarters of a magnitude from 14 to 20. It's noticeable. If you want it to basically punch you in the face, you'd probably be looking at like a 24 inch telescope. But a 24, once you start to get to that 20 inch mark, now you have to start considering other things as well. Because A, you are getting your magnitude jump. But now you have a telescope that's so big that you're going to need a larger vehicle or you're going to need a trailer to move it around. You're probably going to need some kind of ladder and some specialty equipment to move it and utilize it. So just because you're trying to make that magnitude jump, it's not as easy as when the telescopes are smaller, like the little refractors, anything under about 12 to 14 inch below that. It's easier to work around that but once you pass that 12 to 14 inch mark your jumps are going to have to start becoming a lot more serious on my 28 inch the next logical size for me to go up to notice a major difference would be a one meter or like 40 inch now we're talking about a telescope so if i need to if i ever wanted to make a bigger telescope beyond my 28 i would need to at minimum consider a 36 inch to 40 inch telescope now we're talking telescopes where the mirrors are going to cost 40 to sixty thousand dollars to make and that's just the mirror so you hit that ceiling pretty quick when you start talking big stuff um, but if you are looking to upgrade and you want to make the jump from your telescope visually take the time maybe download scope wizard mess with it and look for that magnitude jump so if you have a six inch 10 inch or larger would be my recommendation there from the math. If you have an eight inch, you're probably looking at bare minimum 12 inch, 14 would be ideal or bigger. Um, but just remember as you upgrade, the view is going to upgrade, but you also are gonna have to start taking into consideration how you're going to transport it, where you're gonna store it, how much harder is it gonna be, the expense. A lot of things start to add up and then if you get into the serious aperture which i would say 18 and beyond you really have to take some considerations on that um what magnitude can the 28 go to good question i think i can do that in scope wizard as well um what you can you go over here to telescope specifications you click that and you can pop whatever you want in there um it's all done in millimeters. Let me calculate all this. So my 28 inch, according to the math, or any 28 inch for that matter, uh, a 28 inch theoretical limiting magnitude is 16.7. Um, so it's it's down there. Uh, I can go about, um, it's about three quarters of a magnitude deeper than a 20 inch and there is a difference between 20 and 28 even though it's only three quarters it's it's enough to where the 28 inch will edge out a 20 on certain objects um, and it's noticeable so i would say if you can find something that's at least three quarters of a magnitude it's starting to make it worth the conversation one magnitude is the goal but you could get away with three quarters um 16 inch to 20 inch is half magnitude i've done that jump it is also noticeable um things that are at the edge of the 16's capability a 20 inch will be able to take care of without a problem um you know if you have uranometria um a 20 inch can pretty much knock out everything if you're looking for a serious telescope that's not gonna be incredibly difficult to work with a 20 inch dobsonian probably an f4 is awesome uh, it's short enough to where you don't need a big ladder if you want to spend the money and go to f35 or 3.3 .3. but a 20 inch aperture is more than enough for anybody and you can basically see anything you want in the nighttime sky with a 20 inch without a problem and they're not that difficult to work with, especially if you can get a hold of one of these uh, 20 inch F5 obsessions. There's a lot of them out there. They're not that big. They are a big telescope, but they are not ungainly like anything larger than that. But, you know, you work with it. 
this is all just from a visual perspective. Um, now let's jump over to imaging. Imaging is where everything gets flipped around. Um, so in imaging, physical aperture is not the goal. Um, and for anybody who wants to know what the telescope here is, this is the new plane wave Delta Rho 500. Um, they had on display at Neef. It's a 20 inch F3 Cassegrain. It is a monster. And if you want to know about them, you should just go over to Plane Wave. And if you want to buy one, make sure you've probably got a cool hundred grand ready to go. Um, they're not cheap, though they are impressive. Um, but physical aperture in imaging is not the goal. And visual aperture is normally what we talk about all the time. Wouldn't it be great if we had a 20 inch blah, 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 blah. Imaging, it's not the same case. So the big thing that aperture gives us in imaging is angular resolution. So we can get smaller, finer details with a larger aperture. That's what we're gaining. In photography, it's all about speed. Um, the faster the optic, it tends to be better, especially for more modern imaging. A lot of the cameras nowadays have very small pixels. And if we're going to match up to the image scale that we need, so our images don't look soft and gross, um, we want to make sure that we're matching these small pixels with the right focal length, giving us that one to two arc second per pixel resolution is what we're aiming for. But faster optics are gonna mean a couple different things for us. Shorter exposures, less demand on tracking and guiding, for instance, and, and more data and less time. That is what we're looking for. So that's why most imaging telescopes nowadays are like a modern day telescope that would be considered slow, I would say is F7 to F8 is probably considered slow by today's standard. Anything longer than that, you're doing something very specialized or you need some kind of focal reducer to speed it up. Now there are two main factors in imaging that we always need to remember, the f-stop or the optical speed and the focal length. These are the two big factors that dictate what we need in an imaging telescope. We don't really care if it's a 18 or a 20 or a 6 inch or any of that. We don't care too much if that's the aperture. Um, we need the f-stop and the focal length. The focal length is going to give you your image scale or how big an object looks in your field. And then the f-stop is going to dictate how much data you can acquire in any given amount of time. Now here's some exercises on it. So let's start with this. We have two telescopes, they're both 12 inch. We've got, let's say a Newtonian over here at F4 and we have a Cassegrain over here at F10 on the right. Both of them are 12 inch or 300 millimeters in aperture. One has a 1200 millimeter focal length, one has a 3000 millimeter. Now visually, if we were to look through these things, they'd probably look the same. They have the same light grasp. The 12 inch F4 has a shorter focal length at 1200 millimeters. It produces a wider field of view. The 12 inch F10 has a longer focal length, so it's gonna give us a smaller field of view. But they are still 12 inch telescopes and they collect exactly the same amount of light. So both telescopes are 12 inch in aperture. Now the big difference here, this is also using our calculator. This is using the speed uh, difference in light. This is, where'd it go? Yeah, this is our speed difference right here on our app. Again, this is Scope Wizard and the app is free. What you do is you plug in the slower F ratio against the longer or the smaller F ratio and it pops out the difference in speed. So, for an f4 compared to f10 is 6.3 times faster than the f10 is which means a 60 second exposure at f4 is going to be the same as a 6.3 minute exposure at f10 now i'm going to light these up real quick you'll see the one on the left is red and the one on the right is yellow there they have the glow around them remember those colors so the red one 
right here, our 1200 millimeter telescope. This is using a Canon 7D Mark II, which is a APS-C size sensor. So ZW 2600s, all that uh, crop sensor. Um, both telescopes can expose and collect the same amount of light, but in order for the F10 telescope to equal the F4, you have to shoot for way longer to get to the same exposure, um, or the same amount of data that's visible at F4. But your big issue here is going to be your field of view is diminished quite a bit. Um, so both are 12 inch telescopes, but we don't care about that. What we care about is the f-stop and the focal length. This is where your telescope basically converts into a telephoto lens at this point. So the only thing we care about is the optical speed and the focal length. If you own a camera, you probably have a couple different lenses. You've got a wide field lens to collect a big field of view and you have a telephoto lens to zoom in more. That's basically what these two are. You have a 1200 millimeter lens and a 3000 millimeter lens. We don't care that they're 300 millimeter apertures at all. Doesn't matter. Physical aperture really doesn't matter when it comes to photography because what we want to be able to do is collect as much data in the shortest amount of time. And what we, the way we do that is get a fast telescope and cram as much light onto our camera sensor as possible in the shortest amount of time. Let's see, just making sure the questions are good. So now let's flip this around. Now we have two telescopes. Um, let's see, how much can gain really compensate for a slower speed? Um, that's a good question. Now, when you mess with gain on a modern camera, like a CMOS camera, it's like messing with ISO on your camera sensor. Um, you can up the gain the problem was when you up the gain on a camera, your signal to noise ratio goes down essentially. So you're adding more noise to your image. Although you feel like you're making it more sensitive, you're also adding more noise at that point. So I don't normally mess with gain on any cameras. I just use unity gain. Whatever the camera defaults at is what I use. Um, for mine uh, and I just I don't have enough knowledge on that side of the coin right now to really go into depth but that's a good question we'll have to do an episode on CMOS and understanding what the different uh, traits do to assist um, that but you can mess with the gain uh, what I would recommend uh, for anybody who is still playing around with gain is gain is a compromise um, there and what's basically happening there is, yeah, you're increasing the gain. So you're able to pull out some stuff probably in a shorter amount of time, but you're also adding more noise into the image. So there's a, there's a very delicate balance between um, there. Uh, so would full frame uh, be wider? Yeah, so that's kind of the thing. This is what drives me nuts when you start talking about like camera. Whoops, what's going on here? There we go. Oop. There we go. Um, so this is the funny thing about like camera lenses. Um, you'll, you'll hear a lot of people when you're in the photo world, talk about crop factor, like, oh, um, a crop sensor is going to give me more reach and it's going to make my lens more like this focal length to this focal length. What they basically do is they'll do like a 1.6 X crop factor on the lens. So you take the lens and you times the focal length by 1.6 roughly and that's going to give you your focal your new focal length at that point which is trash honestly when you make an optic or you make a lens or you make a mirror that optic is whatever is listed there so if you have a zoom lens like a 24 to 70 it's a 24 to 70 that is what it is. Uh, that's what the focal length of the lenses are. It doesn't matter what the sensor size on the back of the lens is. It doesn't matter if you add some multiplication factor on it, like 1.6x. It. I find that the photo industry vastly overcomplicates things, and it makes it very confusing when we're talking about crop sensors to full frame sensors. You're basically maximizing 
your optic with a full frame sensor. If the telescope or the camera lens is designed to handle full frame, then you are utilizing the maximum illuminated field that that lens or optic can provide. If you're using a crop sensor, you're just not utilizing the lens full capability and there's nothing wrong with that because you're getting probably better illumination with a smaller sensor. You get more real estate as well. So if you have a full frame camera, um, we can actually do that really quick. Uh, let me just pull this up real quick so we have a graphic. I use a website called astronomy.tools. Let me bring this up here. Here it is. Um, field of view calculator. Make sure you switch to imaging mode. You just pick whatever target. Let's just do M16. Um, let's say we have two 600 millimeter telescopes and we'll do here's the full frame so there's our field of view with full frame as maxed out telescope most telescopes are designed to handle full frame and smaller um, more modern telescopes are starting to handle larger sensors to accommodate for the growth of sensors moving forward now let's add a crop sensor into the field of view that's the difference in our field of view right there so the nice thing is if you have a longer focal length telescope and you want more field, you can either A, use a larger sensor as long as your telescope can handle it, or you can use a focal reducer and the focal reducer will speed up the F ratio. So your exposures are gonna be shorter, but you're also gonna to start to get a larger field of view as well. So there are ways around if you have a longer focal length telescope like a schmidt cassegrain it's very easy to go out and get the matched focal reducer and speed it up to f7 or f6.3 or whatever the company that makes it has designed for it you can always speed it up um, which is helpful if you have any schmidt cassegrain nowadays if you're actually trying to image with it like and just take pretty pictures i if and you're trying to shoot at f10 you're going to be there forever especially with a modern day camera. It would be better if you got the focal reducer and sped it up to F7 or F6.3 or whatever the corrector is. Um, and it would be much easier on your mount. If you're shooting at F10 nowadays, you're probably either A, doing science, or B, you're very new to this and you haven't quite figured all the details out on how long you're gonna be sitting there or you're doing planetary or lunar and then it doesn't matter because the object is so bright. Um, but yeah, if you have a telescope that can handle full frame, go get a full frame camera, max out that field of view, but you're just getting more real estate. A larger chip is just giving you more real estate on your image. That's all you're gaining. Um, at that point, you can forget about the crop factors. You can throw all that out. If it really helps it make more sense to you, then you can add an add the crop factor in if you want to do it. But the way the photo industry promotes a lot of this stuff, it's just really confusing at that point. And I had to learn that when I bought my first full frame camera because it was really confusing to me too. Most lenses are designed for full frame. If you have a smaller sensor, you're just not utilizing the entire illuminated circle that that optic can provide. Not a big deal. You're just getting better illumination. That's it. So, all right. Now let's switch that up real quick. Let's say we have two different telescopes that have the same focal length. Um, so we have two telescopes. We have a three inch or 80 millimeter refractor. That's F7.5. And then we have an eight inch or 200 millimeter. That's F3. Both of these telescopes are 600 millimeter in focal length. Their, ap their physical apertures are very, very different. Both telescopes have a 600 millimeter focal length. They have the same image scale. So the eight inch and the three inch, you point it up in the nighttime sky, you're gonna have the same field of view. You have a full frame on both, same field of view. Using the same sensor, same field of view. Now, because the telescope is F3, the eight inch is F3, it's gonna produce an image 6.3 times faster. I didn't actually mean this to come out to be the same factor as the example above. It just kind of worked out that way. So that means our F3 telescope can produce an image 
378 seconds, or I'm sorry, an eight inch F3 at 60 seconds, a three inch telescope at F7.5 would take 378 seconds to equal what you could do at F3. So hopefully that makes sense. So at this point, aperture can help in imaging, but it's not nearly as important as speed or focal length is gonna be for imaging. Um, and the nice thing about imaging is if you can't see it, then just expose longer, expose more. If you have a tiny telescope, it's not a big deal. Just put more exposure time on it and bring it out. That's the advantage of the cameras. I know there's some questions here, so I'm gonna bounce real quick. Um, again, I'm gonna highlight the, the aperture rings here. You have green and you have blue. So here's our green. So this is our three inch telescope at F7.5 with a crop sensor. And then there's our eight inch. They're both exactly the same field of view with the same chip. So it doesn't matter. Their field of view is the same, but the big advantage here is that eight inch telescope at F3 is gonna be able to collect a lot more data in less time, which means you have to guide a lot less and you're not asking so much from your mount at that point as well. Um, there is a question in here. We're pretty much done at this point. Um, so noise in your CCD camera is like light scatter in a telescope tube. I guess you could equate it to that way. Um, noise in your CCD camera is just like more static. Um, it's just adding noise to the image. Um, you're not getting all the information you can get from it. And the higher you draw the gain up on a camera, the more noise you're gonna put into your image. Now, with modern cameras, if you start messing around with the gain, all of your calibration frames have to be redone at the same level of gain. So if you're taking bias frames, most modern cameras don't need darks. Um, they're fairly clean, so you can get away with a lot of biases. But if you're taking calibration frames like flats um, and all of that, um, your gain has to be set to the same gain level in order for it to work out. You can't shoot at gain of 100 and then go take biases at 500 gain or gain of 500. They're going to be all screwed up and your image is going to look probably pretty crazy when you go to work on it. That's why I don't like messing with gain. Um, I really don't think you need to mess with it much. I would much rather be like a CCD camera where the gain is just set at the factory and you don't have to mess with it. I don't think a lot of people need to mess with a lot of the functions that are available to us now. And I think that actually becomes more of a problem for newcomers is there's too many controls for you to mess with when you're new. And it happens a lot with PhD guiding as well. There's a ton of people who wanna go in, they wanna tinker and they wanna mess around with all the different settings in there and you're really just causing yourself more of a headache until you know what you're doing. Just get your camera, plug it in and start imaging with it. Do some research, start to figure that out. And if you need to mess with the gain, adjust it. But for the most part, I would just leave the camera at unity gain and leave it there um let's see what would be a good equivalent refractor to an 8 inch sct with a 6.3 reducer and a spree 150 um i'm assuming we're talking about a from an imaging standpoint um so let me do the math real quick um so if we had an 8 inch telescope and it's at f 6.3 um uh, hold on just a sec i gotta calculate some stuff 6.3 so yeah actually that's a good way of putting it so an eight inch schmidt cassegrain with an f6.3 reducer the focal length is 1278 and that's going to be at f6.3 um so yes if you want a refractor that's equivalent uh, you'd be looking at like an Esprit 150 or an Evo Star 150. Uh, those refractors would be the equivalent to it because an Esprit 150 is F7 natively, 
So that's 1050 on the focal length at f7. So it's going to be slightly slower than a Schmidt Cassegrain. But the advantage of a, of a refractor over a Schmidt Cassegrain is a couple things. Number one, a refractor, you rarely are going to have to collimate. Schmidt Cassegrains, most of the time, I find, are out of collimation and their owners don't know about it because they're so slow at the focus point that you don't really see it. But if you defocus it, you would find out pretty quick. So refractors, you never have to mess with the collimation. Hopefully, you never have to touch it at all. Um, our Esprit 150 at our remote imaging site, we've never touched the collimation. It just is there. Um, another advantage to refractors is they don't have image shift. On a Schmidt Cassegrain, the big problem of a Schmidt Cassegrain um, is that the primary mirror moves. Uh, the advantage of that is you have a ton of focus room at that point. The negative is you're moving an optic. Um, ideally, you don't want to move any of your optics. You want everything to stay put. And then you just have your main focuser handling all the focusing points. Um, Schmidt Cassegrains have what's known as mirror flop and they actually cause tilt in your image because the optics are not squared all the time. Now, some of the more advanced ones like the Edge HDs from Celestron, they do have mirror locks, um, which can be helpful. And then you can put a rear focuser and they're better designed. So if you had to pick a Schmidt Cassegrain to image with, the Edge HD would be probably the best ones to get. Um, but a refractor is probably going to outperform a Schmidt Cassegrain regularly um, because of how simplistic it actually is. Um, they also tend to be a lot sharper um, of an optical system than a Schmidt Cassegrain is. Uh, the figure tends to be better on the refractors, I find. But um, yeah, there's a. I would always pick a refractor over a Schmidt Cassegrain if you're doing deep sky. Now, planetary. You want aperture for planetary imaging and you want focal length. Schmidt Cassegrain is probably the best telescope you can get, like an 11 or 14 inch telescope, like a good 11 to 14 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. That is a planetary monster. And at the end of the month, we're going to have St uh, Chris Go on, who's a world class planetary imager. He uses a Celestron C14 for planetary imaging. He can dive into all of the information for planetary imaging there. So yeah, if you're looking at an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain for a refractor, I would get the refractor. The only major problem to that is refractors of that size for imaging are APO refractors and they tend to be a lot more expensive than their Schmidt Cassegrain counterparts. It's worth it though, uh, personally. So, um, I think that's pretty much it. If you like what you see here on the What's Up webcast, uh, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on a video. It does uh, help us out quite a bit. Um, if you have an idea for an episode, email us at info at skywatchusa.com. Title it What's Up. Give us your idea. Um, again, if you have any ideas right now, they will not air until next uh, year because we pretty much have the rest of the year uh, pin down. Let's see. What's this one here? I have an original ETX 90 F 13.8. Can an F 6.3 reducer uh, from any supplier work? No. Um, Matt Casa grains are kind of complicated when it comes to focal reducers. Um, and the ETX is way too, you might be able to adapt it with some specialized adapter um, I don't know how well it would actually work. Um, Matt Cassegrains, there's not really a great option for focal reducers um, at that point. And focal reducers tend to work best when they're optically matched to the telescope they're designed for. Um, so yeah, uh, I like to put a 2.5x on my 8-inch Schmidt Hess F30. Yeah, so if you're doing the moon. A long focal length telescope like a Schmidt Cassegrain plus a Barlow, but you're shooting such a bright object um, that you don't really care at that point. So planetary and lunar is the reverse of deep sky. So I think that's all the questions there. Um, if you have more, we've got a couple minutes left. But yeah, if you like what you see here, please go ahead and subscribe. Give us an idea. Um, that's pretty much it for understanding aperture. I hope that was helpful. 
Um, as with all of our other episodes, these are all recorded afterwards. So if you need to go back and review anything, this episode will be up probably by this afternoon in full. It takes a little bit of time for YouTube to load the whole episode. Um, but everything is recorded. You can always go back to any one of our episodes that we've done and learn anything that you want for review. Um, next week, we are going to be talking about an interesting topic, photographing the International Space Station. Um, now, there's a couple different ways to do it. We're going to talk about that, whether you're trying to shoot the space station just as it flies across the sky, or you're trying to line it up and do a transit of like the moon or the sun. There's a couple ways to go about doing that. And that's what we're going to be talking about next week. Um, so it should be a pretty interesting conversation uh, next week. Um, again, if you like what you see here, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on a video. Uh, go over to skywatcher.threadless.com for any one of our uh, shirts. They support the channel quite a bit. Um, and that is about it. Um, a month from now, we will also be heading to Ontario Starfest. So if you're going to be at Starfest, please come stop by and say hi to the Skywatcher team. Uh, we will be out there um, with our friends from Astro Backyard. We're going to be hanging out with Trevor and Ashley. So come on out, say hi to the team. It's the first time our team has been up in Canada. Um, so we'll be there showing off like the new CQ350 and some other fun stuff. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you guys. Um, if you have any other ideas or information, please just go ahead and email us and we will see you guys next Friday. Thank you very much. Take care, clear skies and have a great weekend. See everyone. Bye.